right, hello, welcome. Um, on behalf of the Garmin Aviation Training Team, I want to welcome and thank everybody for joining us this evening. We've got a lot of great information tonight. Uh, definitely some unusual times going on around the world, but we're very excited, very glad to be able to do these webinars and, and get a lot of information out there. Uh, this evening, we're going to be talking about the GFC 600 AFCS, or Automatic Flight Control System, one of the Garmin retrofit autopilots that's out there. Uh, if anybody's flown behind a GFC 500 or behind the G1000 system with the GFC 700, the system is going to operate very similar to that, but it does has its its unique characteristics and it's some features may or may not be there depending on some of the equipment you have installed in your aircraft but we're going to do a deep dive on that tonight and hopefully get some good information out of this my name is matt clark i am an aviation pilot trainer here at garmin i've been flying aircraft since i was nine years old i taught for the university of central missouri as a flight instructor for them I do teach part-time at ATD Flight Systems at the Kansas City Downtown Airport. I'm a commercial single and multi-engine rated pilot. I am an active CFII. I find a lot of Piper Warriors, Archers, Arrows, Skyhawks, as well as a couple of Cirrus, SR-22, SR-22Ts. I've been here with Garmin now for about the last five years. First couple of years, I actually spent with our aviation product support team. So if you've ever called in, we answered database questions, operation usage questions on a wide range of aviation products from our retrofits, um, GNS, GTNs, uh, to the integrated flight decks like the G1000, G3 5000, to handhelds, to the Garmin Pilot application. So we, we bounce from product to product very, very quickly. For the last three years, I've been a member of the aviation training team where we teach GTN, GTNXI, uh, the retrofit systems such as G3X, TXI, G500, G600, as well as the integrated flight decks like the G1000, G3500 as well, and then going into some specialty topics like weather, radar, CPDLC, so everything from the pilot perspective there. So jumping in tonight, we've got a lot of good information that we're going to talk about. Uh, first and foremost, with the GFC 600, we are going to talk about the system components and the layout, what makes up this system, what's driving the autopilot, as well as different interfaces that may or may not be installed in your aircraft. Depending on what you have in there, does depend on what the system is able to do and what it's not able to do. So it's important to have a good understanding of that. We are going to cover the AFCS status or enunciations. Everything we'll see from the on the autopilot controller itself to enunciations that we have on our primary flight displays. If we're running, say, a G500 or a TXI flight display, what we can expect to see on those. We'll do a deep discussion on the lateral modes as well as the vertical modes of this autopilot, what enunciations we should expect to see, what they all mean. We'll get into our electronic stability and protection, or ESP, how the system can keep us into a safer flying envelope. We will touch a little bit on abnormal operations. I won't be able to go through every single abnormal operation that's out there, but we're going to cover some of the high-level stuff there. And then we'll actually end it with a flight scenario of how we can use this autopilot from takeoff, in route climb, VNAV descent, approach, as well as into the missed approach and how the system will work with us through there. As we're going through this webinar today, if you do have a question, I do have a couple colleagues with me, uh, feel free to use the questions box within the GoToWebinar platform and we'll be more than glad to answer any questions you may or may not have. If you don't get a question answered this evening or as you're out there flying in the field and you do come up with another question, please email us at aviationtraining.webinar at garmin.com. That email address will be in the upper right-hand corner for the rest of this presentation. But if you have a question that doesn't get answered or a question later down the road, please send it in. We, we will be more than glad to answer any questions you guys have. All right, a uh, couple other things we'll start off or going over this evening. We are not gonna be covering what aircraft are and are not on the AML for this autopilot. We have a couple slides towards the end of the presentation of where we can find that information out. So if you do have that, hold those questions. We'll tell you where we can go find that information here in just a little bit. All right, well, let's go ahead and dive on into the GFC 600 autopilot. 
Now, first and foremost, we are going to cover the system components and the layout. How's the system is interacting? What box, what piece of equipment is talking to which piece of equipment? The first component, the one we're going to interact with the most, is the GMC 605. This is essentially the heart of the autopilot. This is everything we're going to press buttons on. We're going to command the autopilot from this unit. Compatible with a wide range of aircraft, uh, for different performance characteristics, to the more for kind of higher performance single engine, twin engine, into the turbine aircraft. This is a standalone autopilot. So compared to other systems like the GFC 500 that has to pull an AHARS or an attitude uh, source from a different box, this, the GFC 600, in this case the 605 specifically, has its own built-in AHAR, so it doesn't need to pull that information from anywhere else. It's all contained within the box itself. We can integrate this to a number of Garmin displays as well as some third-party displays. So those running uh, G500, G600, or TXI, um, even potentially a G5 or a GI275, this can interface in will vary about what you can show on there depending on the piece of equipment. Other big component of this is the GSA 87 Smart Servo. This is what's driving the control surfaces. Uh, the, they have their own onboard microprocessors, their own built-in electronic torque and speed sensing. Big feature of these motors, they are brushless and they are they have no mechanical slip clutch. So if your hand flying the aircraft, you're very minimal drag on those control surfaces. You almost won't even feel that there's a servo there. Um, overall, the fact that they are brushless motor design and there is no slip clutch on there means you're gonna have an improved reliability compared to some other autopilots that are out there. And ultimately, with the end user and the owner, the are really concerned with, it's going to be lower maintenance cost for the life of the autopilot. So great, great feature, great option for the GFC 600. Optional piece of equipment that we may have installed in the aircraft is the GI-285 mode enunciator, that little box you see on screen. This is if you're just running the GMC 605 itself, you don't, you're not running a Garmin flight display like a G500 or a TXI, then most likely you're going to need this, this 285. It's going to be placed in your primary field of view so you can verify, see what's your active and what your armed modes are, where it's the autopilot doing. If you're running a G500 or TXI, you won't necessarily have this option. If you're running a G5 or a GI285 interfaced in, more than likely, you will be running a GI-285. Uh, it does follow the same co uh, color codes that you'll see with other Garmin autopilots. So green, any green modes you'll see on there are active modes. Anything in white is an armed mode. These do have an identical footprint to other mode enunciators out in the field. So if you are upgrading or swapping from a different autopilot over to a Garmin and you have to have this, chances are this is going to be able to fit in that same that same footprint. And they are LED backlit, so real long-term reliability with this little unit. A couple of basic layouts, and as I said, layouts are going to change depending on the equipment you have. The more sophisticated equipment you interface in, the more capability you're going to be able to get out of the autopilot. Here we have a real basic setup. We have a, a standalone nav interface to the GMC 605, so there's our nav radio, there's our GMC 605, we have an analog HSI, and we have a pitch and roll servo. This is about as basic as this autopilot's going to get. We can add an additional servo for a pitch trim. This does autom well, for the automatic pitch trim, the autopilot can adjust the trim tap as need be, as well as giving the addition of having an electric manual trim. And then we also have the option of a fourth servo for the yaw damper. Some aircraft may need it, some may not. That's a great discussion to have with your installer and see if that's a good fit for your particular aircraft. Now, given this situation, given this setup, more than likely that GMC 605, that autopilot controller, is most likely not in your primary field of view. It's probably in a center stack somewhere. So chances are, in this setup, you're going to need that GI 285 placed it in your primary field of view. Now, 
a good option here if you're running a GNS 430 or 530 WASP that does and is capable of interfacing to the GFC 600 as well as interfacing say our G500 or G600 primary flight displays. Notice with this particular setup we don't have to have that GI-285. In this case, our mode enunciations are going to appear directly on the top of the primary flight display itself, in this case, the G-500. So that takes the necessity of having that 285 out of the equation. Same thing applies. You can interface a GTN 65750 or the GTN XI series will interface in. Same thing, your mode enunciations will still show on the G500 or G600, but gives you a little bit more capability. This is what's going to uh, add the ability for that vertical nav or in route VNAV descent capability. And then, optimal configuration here have a GTN or GTN XI interfaced with the GFC600 and with a TXI flight display, just like the G500 and G600 the mode enunciations will appear directly on the TXI flight display right at the top of the, screen, of the primary flight display. So real quick basic layouts, you are going to see different layouts depending on what equipment you have, but this is a kind of a basic idea of what can and cannot be interfaced to the system here. So now we're going to go ahead and dive into the AFCS enunciations. How do we know what the autopilot's doing? Where is it taking me? Generally speaking, when we're talking on enunciations, anytime we make a change on the autopilot, we press a button, we're going to verify these enunciations. These enunciations are super, super critical for safety of flight. So taking a look first at the GMC 605. On the left-hand side, we we will see a number of different things. Here we're looking at the autopilot engagement section. We have three buttons. We've got the autopilot, but, autopilot button at the top, flight director in the middle, yaw damper on the bottom, and a corresponding light. If there's no light on, then that option is not turned on. Now, starting at the top, if you press the AP button just by itself, it will automatically turn on your flight director, as well as automatically turning on the yaw damper if it's installed in the aircraft. That being said, I can engage the flight director and the yaw damper independently of one another. So if I'm wanting to hand fly the aircraft, but I want that additional reference from the flight director, then I can go ahead, hit the FD button, and if need be, if I want the yaw damper to provide some extra stabilization for me, press the YD button as well. Now, here's a couple of pictures if you are running a Garmin display. Uh, if you're running a G5 or a GI275, uh, you will see the flight director, but you're not going to see any mode enunciations on those units. We'll look others elsewhere for those, but we will show the flight director. Same now for the G500 and the TXI flight displays. You'll show these the flight directors as well as those enunciations. We'll come to that here in a bit. Uh, something to point out when we're looking at flight directors. If we look at the top one here, this is what the picture, this is what the flight display is going to look like. Here we have the flight director is on. I see the magenta bars, I'll see them on my display, but notice that they're hollow. The fact that these magenta command bars are hollow is a sign to me that the servos are not engaged. The autopilot is not flying the aircraft. I am flying the aircraft. Versus, if I look at the picture below, the moment I turn the autopilot on, those bars are going to fill in, the servos are engaged, the autopilot is commanding the aircraft. I can also confirm that down here with the AP button. If I see the green light on and I see my command bars are filled in, then I know my autopilot is engaged. We're building in a bit of a cross check there. So some great redundancy for us. In the center section, we have an LCD display directly on the GMC 605. We're going to show a number of pieces, a number of, of uh, pieces of information in here. On the left-hand side is going to be your lateral modes. In this case, we're right now in a, la a roll mode with a nav mode armed. The center section is your vertical mode. In this case, we're in a pitch mode with altitude select ALTS armed. And the right side is for any system messages we may get. In this case, it's telling me elevator trim up. Now notice the active mode is always going to be on top. In this case, the roll and pitch. You'll see it's the bigger lettering, the bigger numbering, 
will be on top. That's the active. The smaller lettering and smaller numbering on the bottom is your arm. We're waiting to get to that particular section, where, whether it's an altitude to capture, whether it's a, a course to intercept. The armed mode will always be on the bottom. Now the roll and pitch mode are the default mode when you turn the autopilot on, but we'll get into a little bit more of that here in just a, a little bit. For those that are running a G500 or G600, you will see the enunciations directly on top of the page or on top of the primary flight display. And this does conform with other Garmin systems, such as the G1000 or G3 5000. On the left-hand side, you're going to see your lateral mode status. In this case, we're following GPS course guidance. I can look on my HSI. I see a magenta needle. So when I press nav, I will automatically show GPS. In the center section is the autopilot status. Here we can see the autopilot is engaged and turned on, as well as the yaw damper. The right-hand side is our vertical mode. In this case, I've got a vertical speed descent with 900 feet per minute uh, set with an altitude select, ALTS armed, meaning I'm going to descend at 900 feet per minute until I capture my selected altitude. In this case, we have 5,000 feet selected. For those running a TXI flight display, guess what? It's the same enunciations. Left-hand side is your lateral mode. Center section is the autopilot status. Right-hand section is the vertical mode. So we follow the same logic across the board. Makes that a little bit easier if you do run and jump from one platform or one display to another then the enunciations are going to be identical to each other there. So that makes that a little bit easier for us. Now following standard Garmin logic, if you see a green enunciation on any of these displays, that is the active mode. That's where the autopilot is taking us. So in this case, for, for example, these two, heading mode or GPS is active. Uh, anything in white is an armed, such as ALTS, not altitude target select. You could have a nav mode armed where it shows GPS or localizer. Um, any number of different enunciations here. Green is active, white is armed. If you see anything with a yellow, in this case if I were to press the AP button on the GMC 605, or if I press the AP disconnect on my yoke, then I will see the yellow AP flash. That means something has disengaged and now I am flying the aircraft. Now, running any autopilot, doesn't matter if it's a Garmin autopilot or if it's a third party autopilot, always verify your active and armed mode. So it means anytime you make a change, you press a button on the autopilot, we need to go back and we need to verify these enunciations. Never let an autopilot take you somewhere that you don't intend to go absolute worst case scenario, if, if it's not doing what you want it or not doing what you're expecting, disconnect the autopilot, hand fly the aircraft until you can get the autopilot straightened out. There, I always reference a CJ4 crash that was up in Cleveland, Ohio a few years ago. Uh, individual was flying in the evening or at night, fairly newly trained on that particular aircraft, departed, thought he was, or was trained to turn the autopilot on, Press the button to engage it, but didn't verify. Blew through an altitude constraint, blew through a speed constraint. Uh, ATC started getting on them. At one point, uh, they recorded the aircraft was in at least a 60 degree bank and a 40 degree pitch down before the aircraft impacted the ground. And unfortunately, this is an accident where everybody perished on board the aircraft. And it's something that can be that could have been very easily prevented by simply verifying. So if you don't take anything else away from this, take this away. When you make a change on the autopilot, verify that that mode is engaged or verify what those enunciations show. All right, now we're going to jump into some lateral modes. So those are going to be all down at the bottom of the GMC 605. Now the roll mode is the only one you don't see on there. When you turn the AP on by itself, you haven't pressed any other buttons on the autopilot, that is your default mode. It is taking the autopilot, it's commanding it to wings level. If I were to press any one of these buttons twice, say if I was on a heading mode, and then I hit the heading button again, then it will default back to a roll mode, wings level. 
Now this is kind of a dumb mode. It's not following a heading bug. It's not following nav guidance. It's simply keeping the wings level. The next one over here, or the next one we'll talk about is the heading bug, or the heading mode. This is gonna follow and uh, track your selected heading. So on your primary flight display or HSI, you set your heading bug, you engage heading mode, and all the autopilot's gonna do is follow that bug. So as you're getting vectored around by air traffic control, they tell you to fly a heading, set your bug, turn heading mode on. Pretty straightforward. Nav mode is gonna select and acquire whatever nav source you have selected. So if you're following GPS, if you're on GPS course guidance, the moment you press that nav button, you're gonna see a GPS annunciation and you are following GPS course guidance. Same thing would apply if you're green needles or in VLOC on your GTN or 43530. If you're tracking a VOR, it's gonna say VOR. If you're tracking a localizer, it will say localizer. We'll definitely see that if you're flying any sort of ILS or localizer approaches. That's the lateral mode I would expect to see. Next button is our approach mode, or APR. This is going to acquire and track your selected nav source laterally. Same thing such as VOR, GPS, localizer, um, depending on the type of approach we're getting ready to do. As well as arming the appropriate vertical mode, such as GS for glide slope for an ILS, or GP for an LNAV, LNAV VNAV, LNAV plus V, LP plus V, anything with vertical guidance. And I would expect to see, let's say if I'm getting vectored into a final approach course, I could see a arm status here, and then I could see the arm GS or GP for my vertical mode on the autopilot here as well. Last button on there, for those that still fly back course, uh, back course approaches, we do have the back course button that's going to capture, track that localizer back course. It knows it's reverse sensing, so you're not going to have to worry about the autopilot steering you the opposite direction. It knows it's flying a back course, and they can make an appropriate adjustment as need be. All right, moving on to the vertical sections. We talked about the lateral modes. We had a default mode of roll. Well, the vertical mode, when you press the AP button without pre-selecting anything else, its default mode is pitch, P-I-T. Now I can change this pitch mode. So if I press the AP button or the flight director button, I can use that up and down wheel and I can adjust that pitch in 0.5 degree increments. So I can adjust a climb out pitch if I wanted to. I don't typically use a lot of pitch mode, but it is an option for us. Going back down to the bottom here, we do have a VNAV button. So those running GTN version uh, 6.51 and higher, or those running GTN XI, you do have the ability to have, and depending on the other equipment installed in the aircraft, have the ability to capture and couple to a VNAV descent. Uh, for more information on VNAV, I'm gonna reference you back to the VNAV webinar we did previously. Next one is our IAS or indicated airspeed mode. This is a mode I prefer to use on climb out. I can set a climb speed and let the autopilot fly. Now when I press that IAS button, it's going to automatically default to whatever airspeed I'm currently flying at. So if I'm in my climb out, if I'm at VY and I press IAS, that is the airspeed it's going to fly out at. However, if I, if I'm, uh, if I need to adjust that, uh, some of the aircraft I fly, I've got VY, but then I've got a climb speed that I want to climb out with. So I can press IAS. And then I can adjust that airspeed using that up and down wheel in one knot increment, and I can refine and fine tune the air climb speed that I want for that day. Same thing here for vertical speed. When I press the VS button or vertical speed, it's gonna to default to whatever current vertical speed I'm doing. So if I'm at level flight, I'm at zero vertical speed. When I hit VS, it's gonna show zero vertical speed. If I'm in a descent already, I hit VS, it's going to capture whatever I'm currently doing. And then just like IAS, I can use the up and down wheel and I can fine tune that rate of descent. I, I can use vertical speed in a climb, I can use IAS in a descent, but I don't like to do that. I prefer to use IAS for my climb, I like to use vertical speed for descent. In my mind it works a little bit better. The altitude button on there is going to capture your current altitude, that's all that's going to do. Now when we get into some scenarios, 
and start climbing out, you realize I really don't need to use that button. And on a lot of flights, I don't. I don't typically press that button a whole lot. But if I'm doing any sort of hand flying and then I want the autopilot to kind of take back over, I can press the auto, uh, altitude button and it'll capture wherever altitude I happen to be at. Now, I can use that up and down wheel to adjust that altitude plus or minus 200 feet. Uh, so I can fine tune it just a little bit if I need to, but all it's going to do is capture your current altitude. Last button that we're going to see on there is our level button, that big blue button. That's more or less our get out of jail button. When I start to, when I teach a lot of instrument students, first time we go into IMC, we can't tell which way's up, which way's down. They're fighting the aircraft. When it all gets real bad, all I'm trying to do is get him back to level flight, and then we can start making a change from there. This would allow us to do that. If I press that button, if the autopilot's already engaged, great. It's simply going to command zero degrees of bank, and it's going to command zero vertical speed. However, if I don't have the autopilot on, when I press that level button, it will automatically turn the autopilot on for me and do the same thing. Command zero degrees bank and zero vertical speed. So one button, I can engage it and get the aircraft into level flight. So great, great little safety button there. Which is going to bring us here now into our electronic stability and protection, or ESP. Now, ESP, Electronic Stability and Protection, is a way to, in a sense, keep the aircraft in a protected envelope. We can kind of see there, there's a pitch envelope, there's a bank or a roll envelope. We're trying to keep it for normal maneuvers while we're hand flying the aircraft. It'll operate, with no servos are going to engage. But as we fly outside of that protected envelope, now we're going to start feeling increasing forces on our controls. The servos are going to start engaging, and they're going to try to get us back in to a safe or safer flying envelope. The further you go beyond that envelope, the greater the force you're going to feel on those controls. Now, ESP does have an ability to turn on level mode if it needs to. So if you're in outside of that protected envelope for more than 10 seconds within a 20 second time period, you're going to get an engaging autopilot alert and the autopilot is automatically going to go into level mode. Here you'll see LVL on our, our lateral enunciation, LVL on a vertical, the same on our flight display such as G500 or TXI. So now there are ways around it, and when I get to the end here, I will talk about how we can disable ESP, but we'll get to that here in just a second. Now the role component of it is pretty standard and pretty common across the platforms. We're trying to discourage banking beyond 45 degrees. Now this is why we are hand flying the aircraft. On the first picture here on the left, I can see a double hash mark on my attitude indicator. That's the engagement section. The moment I roll past 45 degrees of bank, if I take a look on that right-hand picture, those double hash marks are going to move up to 30 degrees. So we've rolled to 45. The autopilot's going to try to get us to back within to 30 degrees of bank. The more I fight it, the more I go past that initial 45, the more aggressive the servos are going to be, the more resistance I'm going to feel in the controls as it guides us back into Fly, or back into that protected envelope. Pitch protection works in, in very similar fashion here. We're trying to keep you from pitching up too much or pitching down beyond some designated limits. Now, these limits are going to vary airframe to airframe. So, take a look at your aircraft flight manual supplements. For an example, the uh, Cessna 208, it's a 16.5 degrees up or down. You go outside of that, ESP is going to engage. Whereas an A36, it's 21 degrees up, 25 degrees nose down. So it is going to vary. This is the importance of reading through and having an understanding of your AFMS. But same as the roll protection, the further I go beyond that protected envelope, the more force I'm going to feel in the controls trying to drive me back into that protective envelope. Now we do have some high speed and low speed protection. These are going to work with the autopilot is on or engaged. Uh, high speed protection is going to try to prevent you from going over V&E. And I'll pitch the nose up to keep you from overspeeding the aircraft. 
our low speed protection is going to try to prevent the aircraft from stalling or going below a certain set speed. Once again, refer back to your AFMS for that value. This does, that low speed protection does require a couple things. First and foremost, we require a Garmin primary flight display and or a GTN with a valid terrain database. We need that terrain database to compare to your GPS altitude so we know how high off the ground you are. And the low speed protection is automatically going to inhibit below 200 feet AGL. So as you're coming into, in, underneath the approach, you're coming into a landing phase, we don't want the aircraft, we don't want the autopilot to start lowering the nose when we're already low to the ground. So the autopilot will automatically inhibit for us. On the overspeed protection side, as we said, this is going to work when the autopilot is on and in some modes while you're descending. As we start speeding up and start getting close to V&E, it is going to pitch the nose up. We will see a max speed display on the GMC 605 as well as on our uh, G500 or TXI flight display. Your vertical mode is automatically going to change to an indicated airspeed, so it's going to try to keep you just below V&E until we get the aircraft slowed down. Your previous mode is automatically going to arm. Now, once we reduce some speed, we slow down a little bit, we get away from V&E, that previous mode can become active again, and it can resume that descent or whatever mode you are, you are currently doing. For under speed protection, same thing. The active when the autopilot's on, we're discouraging you from going below an established speed. Take a look at the aircraft flight manual supplement for that value for your aircraft. Uh, you'll get instead of a max speed this time you're going to get a min speed display in your PFD Opposite of the overspeed it's going to pitch the nose down it's trying to keep the aircraft from stalling But it is going to switch you into an IAS mode trying to keep you above that stall speed or that uh, established preset speed you'll get an airspeed alert and Just like the other when we start increasing some speed the previous mode that was armed can come back to active again. Now for all of this, for especially for your pitch and roll, I get this question a lot. I'm going out, we're going to be doing commercial standard steep turns, I need to go to a 50 degree bank angle, or I need to get past the ESP, or I just want to disable it. This can be done very easily. If you press and hold the autopilot disconnect for six seconds, it will automatically disable ESP, and you'll see that on the GMC 605. It'll say ESP disabled. Enabling ESP is as simple as turning the autopilot back on. Once you hit the AP button, that ESP disabled will go away, and now it is automatically rearmed. So very easy to disable it, very easy to re-enable it. All right, so now we're going to dive into a few abnormal operations. Now, I'm not going to go, I don't have the time tonight to go through every single abnormal operation. I do highly encourage that you take a look and read through the, uh, the AFMS. It will go into more detail. Basic theory, though, if something starts to go wrong, something's not going right, grip the controls firmly, disconnect the autopilot, hand fly the aircraft. All right, so first and foremost, if you see a flashing AP LED, take my laser pointer and pop it over there, it means you, we, it's going to indicate a manual autopilot disengagement, and you're going to get an oral alert just like this. AP flashes, and then that light's going to go away. We see the green light is now just gray, it's off, and we are hand flying the aircraft. That's whether I hit the AP button on the 605 or if I hit the AP disconnect you'll get that notification. If you just see it flashing, typically means you're going to have a trim failure or a mistrim condition. In this case, notice how we've got the electric trim message up there telling us we need to trim up a little bit. We're in a mistrim condition. The autopilot's constantly having to fight that control surface. So you're not going to get that or alert like you did with the disconnect, but you will see that light flashing. Now, if you see the AP button flashing red, that means that's an automatic disconnect to the autopilot. You're going to get an aura alert, you're going to get a flashing, and you're going to get a fail alert. It's going to sound and look a lot like this. Now, 
Now that tone is going to keep going until we acknowledge it. And we acknowledge it by pressing either the AP button on the autopilot or pressing the AP disconnect on the yoke. That means something's gone wrong with the autopilot and it's going to keep alerting us to it until we press one of those buttons to acknowledge that yes, we understand, we are hand flying the aircraft, the autopilot is no longer engaged, and we can see here we've got that AP fail message. Now if you see your flight director flashing, in this case we had a heading and IAS were active, if a mode drops, so if I manually changed to CDI source, I went from GPS to VLOC, um, it could be any number of reasons, uh, manually, there could be another, another reasons why a mode could drop, but if a mode does drop, you'll see the flight director flash for 10 seconds, and you roll in pitch mode, potentially you're going to come back as your active mode, depending on the mode drop. All right, the last little bit I've got for this evening, we're going to run through a little bit of a flight scenario. We're going to start with uh, from takeoff, in route climb, and through our descent into the approach phase and into a couple of missed approach, and how we can use the autopilot to our advantage pretty much during all stages of flight. So for the sake of this scenario, I'm using a TXI flight display. We're going to run a GTN 750XI with a GFC 600. Now you could do this with a GFC 500, you can run a GTN, GNS, bear in mind different equipment, you may or may not have some of these features. If those running TXI, you can change your bug selection, say for IA, for indicated airspeed or for your altitude pre-select, same for vertical speed or heading, we're gonna do, we can do directly from uh, the display itself by tapping on the screen. I can also use the dual concentric knobs down in the corner big knob to select which field, little knob to make the adjustment depending on comfort level, depending on you know, if it's a smooth flight, if we're getting uh, if we're in any sort of moderate turbulence or anything like that. For the scenario today, we're going to be running from KIXD, which is New Century, Kansas, over to ANX, the uh, Napoleon VOR for the Kayla 3 arrival into St. Louis. A real quick, easy flight for us. So first off, we're here on the runway. We're saying we're taking off runway 18, and we get the instruction on departure, fly runway heading, climb and maintain 3000. Pretty standard departure instruction. So autopilot, or system-wise, I'm gonna first set my heading bug on my primary flight display. So I've got it centered up to 180. I'm gonna set my altitude, pre-select that on my PFD. In this case, we're told to climb to 3000, so I set 3000 on my display. Let's start that with first. Any sort of altitude climb or descent, start by selecting the altitude first. Now, those who have a go around button installed in the aircraft, I can hit the GA button. That's going to engage my flight director. It's not going to turn the autopilot on, but it engages the flight director. And I'm going to notice I have a GA enunciation and a GA enunciation. Here I can see ALTS is armed. So which is altitude target select, meaning I'm going to capture the uh, pre-selected altitude, in this case 3000. So what we're doing, we're setting a climb pitch attitude. That's all we're doing here. So we're cleared for takeoff. We give it some power. We start taking off. Flaps up, gear up as appropriate. Once we've reached 800 AGL and above the minimum engagement speed, we can turn the autopilot on. So here, we simply press the AP button on the autopilot. Now, going back to what we said previously, I press a button on the autopilot, we're verifying the status. So I hit the AP button, I see the green light lit up, my flight director's green, same for the yaw damper, looking on my flight display, I'm in go around laterally, I see AP is active, I see yaw damper is active, with go around vertically, with altitude select. So this is exactly what I want to see. And we can see the same thing on the 605. So continuing the climb. Once I'm high enough, I've powered up, I've cleaned up, everything's good the way I need it. I'm going to go ahead and select heading mode. So I press heading on the autopilot. I'll start tracking that heading bug. And I'm also going to go ahead and press IAS. That's going to go into an indicated airspeed. Remembering the moment I press IAS, it's going to select whatever airspeed I'm currently flying. And then I'm going to use my up and down wheel to fine tune that climb speed. 
I've made a bunch of changes on the autopilot so we can verify on the AFC on the GMC 605 as well as my primary flight display so we can see we're heading mode where AP or autopilot's active the yaw damper's on I'm in an indicated airspeed climb at 125 flying at 125 knots with altitude select armed meaning it's going to level me at 3000 I see the same thing on my GMC 605 headings active IAS at 125 with ALTS armed. So I've got my verification, I got my redundancy there. Next instruction, ATC tells us turn left heading 090, climb and maintain 7000. Straightforward instruction. We're already in heading mode, so I'm going to take my heading bug, I'm going to set it to 090. Since we're already in heading mode, the aircraft's automatically going to turn and follow that heading bug. Next up, Reset my altitude selector. So take my altitude selector, roll it up to 7,000 feet. Now, this is where it gets fun. If we have already leveled off, I'm going to need to go back down to my GMC 605. I'm going to need to re engage IAS and let it climb. Verify my status, use that up and down wheel to fine tune that airspeed. If I haven't yet leveled off, if I'm still in the climb and I reset that altitude to a higher altitude, the aircraft is simply going to continue to climb on up. So it depends on where we are when we get this clearance. Once again, we've made some changes. We've give, reset some altitude. We've potentially re-engaged indicated airspeed mode. So we're going to verify that our autopilot is still doing what we expect it to be doing. Next instruction here, proceed direct to the Napoleon VOR, climb and maintain 15,000. Still a straightforward instruction. I'm going to start by setting direct to on my navigator. So I go into my flight plan, tap on Napoleon, direct to. Once I've done that on my navigator, the GPS guidance is taking me to the fix I need to go to. I'm going to go down to the autopilot and I'm going to engage nav mode. Now, since I'm flying a GPS course, I can see GPS as my armed lateral mode, as well as I can see it on my vertical or my uh, primary flight display. I'm going to reset my altitude bug. I'll roll it up to 15,000. And then same thing as before. If I'd already leveled off, I need to re-engage IAS or indicated airspeed, reset my airspeed, and to keep that climb. If I have yet to level off, if I'm still on my climb out, same as before. All I need to do is roll my altitude selector up. And of course, we're going to verify. We've made some changes again. So anytime I press a button on the autopilot, I'm going to verify here GPS is active laterally. I'm in an IAS climb at 125. Altitude select is armed, meaning we're going to capture my pre-selected altitude. Same thing on my PFD. GPS is my lateral mode. We're following GPS guidance. IAS at 125, ALTS leveling off at 15,000. Now, as we get closer, normally we get to within 200 feet of our selected altitude, you're going to see ALTS become the active mode. So it's ALTS at 15,000, meaning it's getting ready to level us off. And I see ALT, altitude hold, is armed, automatically armed. It does that automatically. I don't have to press the ALT button at all. Once we get to 15,000, then altitude hold becomes the active vertical mode. We can see altitude at 15,000. All my other modes automatically dropped off. So I'm no longer in an IAS climb. I'm not in vertical speed. We're simply going to hold and maintain this altitude. Does it for me automatically. So now we're in route. Now we're ready to come on down. We get the instruction here. Crossing coop, descend via the arrival, maintain 7,000. So when we talk about VNAV, we have a three-step process. The first is to verify all of your altitudes within your flight plan. So for those on how to load that into that uh, G, into the GTN, take a look at that VNAV webinar, and we'll, that'll talk all about how to set up the profile. For here, we're going to say everything is good. We verified our altitudes in the flight plan, and we're going to descend lowest altitude down to 7,000. So step one, we verified them all the altitude. Step two, we're going to set our altitude selector to the lowest assigned altitude. We do this on purpose. That altitude selector does take priority over that VNAV descent, meaning if I don't roll my selector down, 
the autopilot will not descend. Or if I set it to some intermediate altitude, it's going to level me out at the altitude that I've selected and not and no longer follow that VNAV descent. So in this case, they've told us to descend via, so we're responsible for descending through all the altitude constraints. So I'm going to load, set it to my lowest assigned altitude here at 7,000. Step three is to arm VNAV. I hit the VNAV button on the autopilot, and I can see I've got VPath as an enunciation on 605, and I see VPath on my AFCS, or on my primary flight display, and we're going to verify. Now, unlike some other systems, uh, G1000, a lot of airframes put a time limit on when you can arm VNAV. If you arm it too early, you've got to go back and, in effect, rearm it again. With the GFC 600, there is no time limit, so I can arm VNAV as early as I want prior to the top of my descent. One minute out from the top of my descent, I'm going to see my VDI, or vertical deviation indicator. I'm going to see the vertical speed target on my VSI, and I'm going to show the next VNAV altitude constraint. In this case, it's a, at or above 11,000. So, that's the next one it's using for guidance on our descent down to 7,000. So in this case, we're going to say we followed the VNAV down. We got down to 7,000. Everything went just fine. We're starting to get closer to St. Louis. ATC comes up and tells us descend and maintain 3,000. Straightforward instruction. So we're going to work this the same way we did on the climbs. We're going to start by selecting the altitude on our primary flight display. So we're told to descend to 3,000, so I roll my altitude selector to 3,000. Next, I like to use vertical speed on in the descent, so I'm going to press that VS button. And then I can use my up and down wheel, or I can use the primary flight display. If I really wanted, I could tap on the screen or use my knobs. I can set the vertical speed either side. But we're going to press VS first, and then use one of those options to set the desired vertical speed. In this case, I selected for an 800 foot per minute descent. So I see negative 800 on my 605. I see a down arrow on my TXI flight display, meaning we are descending. We've made a bunch of changes on the autopilot. We're going to go back and we're going to verify, in this case, vertical speed is active. And we're going to verify that we see ALTS, altitude target select. And that is because I see ALTS, I know it's going to level me out at 3000. Getting in a little bit closer, now they're now vectoring us in to the final approach, or into an approach. So we get this instruction here, fly heading 090, intercept the localizer, maintain 3000 until established, cleared, ILS 1 to right. Pretty standard instruction. So I'm going to start. Let's get our heading set. So I wrote, set my heading bug to 090. I go down to my 605, I press the heading bug, and I'm going to verify that I see heading mode engaged. I see it on the top and I see it green on my TXI display, so we know we're good there. Next, we're going to verify. Um, we've, we've set our pre FD. Typically, in industry standard, we've been cleared for the approach, so I can go ahead and hit approach mode. Notice how with this particular setup, with TXI, with GTN, with the GFC 600, I can arm approach mode. I see the APR button there, and I see localizer armed, I see glide slope armed. When I get a little bit closer, that we get into the auto switch range, the system can auto switch me to green needles, or if I want to go ahead and do so now, I can go ahead, hit the CDI button there on my TXI display, and switch over to green needles to track that localizer inbound. So we're going to verify that we're on the appropriate source. This is a great time to do that. We've made a lot of changes again. I've been cleared for the approach. So we're going to verify. So heading's still good. We're following that current heading. We're out to hold at 3,000. I see localizer armed. I see glide slope armed, meaning when we capture the localizer, that becomes active. When I intercept the glide slope, that will become active and take me down to the rest of the approach. And this is exactly what's happening. As I intercept the localizer, heading mode is going to drop off. Needles coming in on my HSI. Localizer becomes active. That's the green mode. And then as I continue flying the approach, my green diamond, my VDI, centers up. 
glide slope now becomes active, and those are the only modes I see laterally and vertically. It's simply going to fly the rest of the approach for us. Now, per the AFMS, once you get to within 200 feet AGL, we need to disengage the autopilot. So, in a sense, when we get to our decision altitude, we have a decision to make. We can either disengage the autopilot and land the aircraft, or if we don't have our clouds and we don't have our visibility, if we've got a go around button installed, I can hit go around, let the autopilot stay engaged, and start taking me through the mist. For this scenario, we're going to say weather was too bad at St. Louis, we couldn't get down underneath the weather, or the visibility wasn't far enough, we need to go mist. So I want to press go around, it tells the GTN, my navigator, that I need to go mist. I'm going to power up, I'm going to clean up as appropriate. When I press go around, I'm going to see GA and GA, go around laterally, go around vertically. That's keeping my wings level and is commanding the aircraft up to a go around pitch attitude. And we get the following instruction. We tell ATC we're going missed. They tell us to fly the published missed approach. So I press go around. We verify the go around enunciations. I power up. I clean up the aircraft. I start talking to, to ATC as appropriate. As we're climbing out, I'm going to verify that I have the appropriate missed approach altitude. On a precision type approach, I like to bug my missed approach altitude. So if I do run into this situation, it's one less thing I have to do. And then once we powered up and cleaned up, we need to go back and re-engage nav mode. We press the nav button, we go back into GPS course guide. So when we activate the, G the missed approach on the GTN, it auto switches back into GPS. By pressing nav, I can now follow the rest of that missed approach, in this case, the, the, the published missed approach. If ATC had given me a heading to fly instead, I would go into heading mode. If I'm in a prolonged climb, I am going to go ahead and pop back into IAS, or indicated airspeed, and same thing as on our initial climb out. I'm going to use that up and down wheel to, to reset and define the appropriate climb speed I want to climb out at. And this, at that point, will take us up to the selected altitude, in this case 5,000, and we're going to have continual guidance all the way into the missed approach procedure. Now, we do have a couple resources here. We're coming up to the end of this. Uh, for those running G500, G600, there are some autopilot references in there. Same thing for those running a TXI flight display. There is a separate GFC 600 pilot's guide. It's worth the time to to read through that, I highly, highly recommend taking the time and reading through the, air, the, the airplane flight manual supplement. It's going to tell you what your specific aircraft is capable of and what it's not. So take the time and read through that guy. So now for those that are wondering, is uh, my aircraft on the AML? If you go down to or go to Garmin.com/gfc600, there's a supported aircraft uh, tab. This is going to show a list of currently supported aircraft. It's going to list the aircraft that are currently going through certification, as well as a list of planned aircraft that are going to start in the next 12 months. If you don't see your aircraft on there, however, we do have a link where you can go in, you can request that your aircraft be added to the certification or to our AML. There's also an option there if you're willing to loan your aircraft to be used for that certification, you can do that as well. So if your aircraft's not on there and you want the autopilot, send this out to you, send it out to your buddies, and go to town. Now what you've seen here this evening is just a snippet of what we do, what we teach. Uh, if you want more about the flight displays, if you want more on the autopilot, you want more on GTN, come explore with us at fly.garmin.com slash training. Here we've got e-learning courses, we've got instructor-led courses, as well as potentially creating a custom course depending on your circumstance there. But all this is available through flygarmin.com and under that training tab. And does bring us up to the end of this evening here. As always, please explore more flygarmin.com slash training. As you're out in the field, you do run into questions, please email us here at aviationtraining.webinar at garmin.com. We'd be more than glad to answer any questions. So I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Hopefully we've learned something, uh, something new and something valuable from the GFC 600. So I hope everyone has a safe and wonderful evening.